Welcome back. This is Chris, my brother in Christ, Stephen. Welcome back. Uh, date today is October 15th, year of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2021. And the title of this video is going to be called Christian Nation. Yes, Christian Nation. And so we just finished uh, filming um, Covenant Land. And so now we're going to talk and we learned where the first Christian church outside of Jerusalem was. It was in 36 AD, planted by Joseph of Arimathea. And then we're going to learn about the first Christian nation. All right. And guess where that is going to be found? Yes, if you've guessed it, it's going to be found within the covenant land. Yes, as we talked about in the last video series. All right, so the first Christian church, or the first Christian nation, correction, the first Christian nation, uh, by the year uh, 140 AD, all the original apostles, disciples, and those who had been associated with them had passed on into their eternal rest. The last being the noble children of the glorious Claudia and Rufus Pudens, right? Now, Claudia was, I believe it was Gladys, and Gladys was a uh, Caradoc's daughter. And uh, so she was adopted as a daughter for um, the Emperor Claudia. Um, I believe that's what it was. Uh, so anyway, her name was changed to Claudia, and then she met, uh, married the senator Rufus Pudens, and that's where you had that um, establishing a church in Rome in 58 AD. All right, so St. John had outlived all the original three groups selected by Jesus. Uh, he lived to the remarkable old age of 101 years old. Joseph, the apostle of the British, had died about 80, 82 AD at Avalon, also known as Glastonbury. A few of them had lived to see the fulfillment, uh, a fulfillment of the command to go to all the corners of the world and preach the gospel, and had seen the Christian platform on which the nails each had labored firmly established. Their lives were the nails that held it fast. It seems almost impossible to believe that this handful of men and women could have achieved such a formidable, formidable conquest in so short of time. Let's see, in a footnote, it's talking about Irenaeus speaks of him as still living in 98 AD, and Jerome dates his death as 68 years after the crucifixion. And then you have July 27th, uh, 82 AD according to Cressy. So these are different um, sources pinpointing the death of Joseph of Arimathea. Now undoubtedly it is the greatest and most enduring world conquest in the history of time. Unarmed, these gentle, uh, valorous champions of goodwill conquered the evil forces of the mightiest armies of the ancient world. Their only weapon, the promise of Christ. In the year 137 A.D., St. Timotheus, or Timotheus, son of Claudia and Pudens, Claudia Pudens, had journeyed from Rome to baptize his nephew, <coughs> King Lucius, at Winston or Winchester. All right, so let us go back. And remember, we're talking about the great battles. Um, we're looking at, what, 36 AD, Joseph of Arimathea um, planted the first Christian church in Avalon or Glastonbury and uh, <clears throat> was given um, 12 hides of land by uh, King Arviragus. And then in 42 AD, this shows you how fast um, Druidism, Druidism, which was the Old Testament form of Christianity, uh, was converted to Christianity. And then you have uh, Emperor uh, Claudius, is that what it is? Emperor Claudius that was going to go and waged war on Britain. I think it was for nine years, ultimately uh, resulting in the capture by betrayal of Caradoc. And Caradoc was brought to um, from Britain to Rome, and uh, he was given um, he was pardoned, and his family lived there for seven years. And uh, his that was part of his probation. Part of his probation, yeah. And then after seven years, years, he could return home, but just right. couldn't fight. 
uh, against the Romans, which he honored his word. So his uh, children were um, uh, Gladys, whose name was changed to Claudia, and then Claudia is mentioned in the New Testament. And, uh, and Claudia married uh, uh, Rufus Pudens. And then we also see the other, uh, the son there, I'm trying to remember. Linus. Linus, I believe. Eubulus. Yeah, it's just kind of like a family tree there. So we see that in the year 137 AD, St. Timotheus, son of Claudia, uh, Pudens had journeyed from Rome to baptize his nephew, King Lucius, at Winston or Winchester, at the same time consecrating him defender of the faith as legal royal successor to his ancestor, Arviragus, upon whom Joseph had confirmed the original honor, this began a new wave of evangelism in Britain, which, it is said, had somewhat waned since the death of Joseph of Arimathea. According to his genealogy, Lucius was son of Col, C-O-E-L, son of St. Silenus, son of Caradac, son of Bran, son of Lyr. By intermarriage, he was also directly descended from Arvaragus of the Cornish Devon Silurs, or the Silurian dynasty. This made Lucius the great-grandson of both Caradoc and Arvaragus. Remember, Caradoc was the uh, pen dragon, uh, the grand commander fighting against Rome. Truly a majestic heritage. The most notable event in the meritorious reign of King Lucius was performed in the year 156 AD when at the National Council at Winchester he established Christianity as the national faith of Britain. All right. So King Lu uh, Lucius, I believe that, I'm going to spell it for you, but understand this. Lucius. Lucius, maybe that's how you pronounce it. Lucius. <laughs> Can they see that, Stephen? Yeah. Lucius. Okay. Or Lucius. Lucius, maybe that's Lucius. And that was in 156 AD. So now we have, uh, so what does he do? He established Christianity as the national faith of Britain. So this is the first Christian nation, all by these Britain, by the Silurian dynasty that fought against Rome connected to the first Christian church and also and uh, first Christian church outside of Jerusalem and also we have the uh, first Christian church in Rome as well in 58 AD. By this act he solemnly declared to the world that Britain was officially a Christian nation by act of parliament. This act is described in the British triads as follows, quote, King Lucius was the first in the Isle of Britain who bestowed the privilege of country and nation and judgment and validity of oath upon those who should be of the faith of Christ. Winchester was the ancient capital of Britain where its kings were crowned for over 1,500 years. It was founded in 500 B.C., Wow, founded in 500, 500 BC. years before Christ. Wow. Now it was all about the migrations of Israel going into Great Britain. Uh, quoting from uh, August, uh, Augustin, Augustin Asio Mission, 597 AD, it reads, quote, Britain officially proclaimed Christian by King Lucius, at National Council at Winchester, 156 A.D. So now we have the first Christian nation in 156 A.D. Do you think that might be newsworthy in America? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't every Christian know about this information, about the first Christian church outside of Jerusalem and the first Christian nation, right? Absolutely. And that was in Great Britain known as the Covenant Land, right? Because that's what Great Britain means, is means covenant land. So that's really newsworthy. That is really amazing. So as we continue here, what do we see? In so few words is described one of the most momentous events in Christian history. Officially establishing Lucius as the first Christian king by national act of council. His great-grandsires, uh, Caradoc and Arvaragus, 
were Christian kings in person, but they had not proclaimed it by the national order and council over the realm. The time then was not uh, propitious. Their era was the period of acceptance, conversion, organization, and the vanquishment of their mortal enemy, the Romans, in defense of the faith. Years of preparation by the diligence of the apostles, their disciples, and those that followed after the great British edict was joyously welcomed by Christians in other lands. Uh, Sibelius 250 AD shows this national establishment was acknowledged elsewhere beyond the confines of Britain. He writes, uh, Sibelius in 250 AD writes, quote, Christianity was privately confessed elsewhere, but the first nation that proclaimed it as the religion and called itself Christian after the name of Christ was Britain. All right, so that's important to understand. Now, we've talked about the, um, the Great Reformation. A lot of times they say that, uh, well, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation started in the 1500s with King Henry VIII when he broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. But then they say, well, wait a minute. Actually, um, John Wycliffe, uh, he was the, the morning star of the Reformation. Uh, so, well, where did he get his inspiration from? Right? Goes back to the first Christian church and goes back to the first Christian nation. All right. So, the United States, for, you know, and this is the deal. Today, it's like you, you listen to truth seeker, uh, at Christian truth seekers and the churches today. It's almost like Christianity is like this, this, this cult like Mormonism that was only established in America, right? And there's just like this blindness of, of when you mention Protestant, the Protestant Reformation, they're like, who really cares, man? I don't care about that stuff. Uh, uh, you King Jimmy people, man, you believe in the uh, inspired and preserved Word of God. You guys have some real issues. Well, it's interesting that without the United States of America today, could not exist without the Protestant Reformation. With the Reformer, we consider the mighty warriors of history who fought against the tyranny of kings with a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other, right? So that's what we see. We see this, this aspect here of talking about the um, uh, John Wycliffe, for example. John Wycliffe was in 1320. Uh, to December 31st, 1384. And what did he do? He translated, he translated the Bible into the common language of the right. people, and that was in Middle English. It's really hard for Christians today to actually grasp the concept that God translates the Bible into the vulgar language or the common language of the people so that the common person can have access to the living Word of God. Today, You'll find people go, well, you know, uh, the Bible has these mistranslations, so therefore you got to go through me and I got this special revelation, or you have to go over here to some paper pope or strong skin coordinates to understand the Word of God. And that is absolutely wrong. And it really goes against the fundamentals of the Christian faith, because the Christian faith is all about the Word, right? It's all about Scripture. It's all about sola scriptura. See, the Protestant reference Reformation was about what? The truth against the world. That was the Druid cry. But it's sola scriptura means the Bible alone, scripture alone. This Bible trumps NASA. This, the word of God, trumps all your paper popes. The word of God, it is the truth against the world. And that's what it is. Okay, so continuing. And then even before that, June 15th, 1215 AD, you have the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta, where you have these uh, the nobles that uh, finally really got tired of one of the most evil kings. What was it? Um, what was that king? Was it King John? Where you have the uh, Robin Hood? Uh, I think it was I think King it, John. Yeah, I think it was King John. King John. And he was a horrible, wicked oh, king. Yeah. And finally, the nobles... Uh, at, I think it was at Runnymede, uh, Runnymede uh, in 1215 AD, they finally said, look, you, um, 
you're really abusing your power. You can't just do whatever you want. You are a minister of God and you're behaving uh, uh, inappropriately. And if you don't knock it off, we will fight back with the sword. And that's where a battle did ensue but 1215. And I thought that was really incredible. And even in uh, July 18th, 1971, on the day, the American Bar Association again came here and pledged adherence to the principles of the great Magna Carta. So even the Bar Association of America recognizes in 1215 AD, the Magna Carta. And that's going back to common law, going back to the scriptures, going back to the very foundation of Christianity outside of Jerusalem, going to the covenant land. Without this, you're going to be missing a key piece of the puzzle. All right, so let us continue. Um, we're looking at um, what well, we see a lot. Okay, so then we also have that Jenna Brand declares, quote, the glory of Britain consists not only in this, that she was the first country which in a national capacity publicly professed herself Christian, but that she made this confession when the Roman Empire itself was pagan and a cruel persecutor, right? That's what we see. And you notice, you notice in the uh, Fox Book of Martyrs, we see um, Constantine's father, um, Constantine the Great, Constantine's father was from what land? Where was he from? You guessed it, he was from the covenant land. He was from Britain and so was Constantine. Constantine was from Britain, all right. And so what did he do? He went down and stopped the persecution of pagan Rome persecuting Christians. All of this is very significant. So, continuing here, we have the church councils, right? We have the church councils. Uh, Theodore Martin of Loven writes of these disputes in, uh, this is Latin, Disputalis Super Dignitatum Tatum Anglis in Gallio in Cancilio Constantio. Uh, 1517 AD and it states three times the authority of the British church was affirmed in ecclesiastical concilia. So we see that three times the authority of the British church was affirmed in ecclesiastical or church councils. Number one, the Council of Pisa in 1417 AD. Number two, the Council of Constance in 1419 AD. And then third, you have the Council of Siena, uh, 1423 AD. It was stated that the British church took precedent of all other churches. That's interesting. The British church took precedence of all the other churches, not the Roman Catholic Church. Roman, the papacy didn't come around until about 600, 600 AD. Remember that the pagan Roman Empire ended around, I don't know, 476 AD. So we see that the uh, uh, being founded by the, the British church took precedent over all other churches being founded by Joseph of Arimathea immediately after the Passion of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, how can you even truly understand the Christian faith without this key component? This is a big deal. Now, we also see that a Christian Britain becomes Roman Emperor. <coughs> the war ended uh, between Rome and Britain in 312 AD when the noble Briton Constantine conquered Rome with an army of Christian Britain and Gaul or France. While marching from Gaul toward Rome, Constantine told his biographer Eusebius that he had seen in the sky a flaming cross with the words, by this conquer. He immediately had crosses sewn on all the army ba battle standards. And uh, I lost my place. Okay, by this, uh, he immediately had his crosses sewn on all the army battle standards or flags and Rome fell to him under the sign of the cross. A short time later, he issued the famous Milan Decree, which gave 
um, imperial approval to the Christian religion, effectively ending the Christian persecution until they were renewed under the popes. Pagan Rome had set out to destroy Christian uh, Britain and was herself conquered by Britain and Christianity made her official religion. Interesting. Uh -huh. And that's all about the stone kingdom that we talked about conquering uh, this beast system. Now that's really interesting. Yet our religious seminaries teach our preachers that Britain was an island of painted savages before Rome brought the gospel in 597 AD. Right. It was not Peter who nationally Christianized Rome, but Constantine, the great grandson of the great grandson of Arvaragus and son of the famous Empress Helena, a British princess. All right. So some really good information, uh, Drama of the Lost Disciples by George F. Uh, Jowett, 1961. Uh, we talked about the origin of um, the origin of early Christianity. Can they see that, Stephen? Yes. All right. Uh, we talked about the Celt, Druid, and Coldy. Really good information there. Right. Uh, Traditions of Glastonbury by E. Raymond Capt. And then St. Paul in Britain by R. W. Morgan, 1860. And then from there you have the British Empire. The British Empire was the most extensive empire, right, um, in world history. And for a substantial time was the foremost world power. It was the product of the European Age of Discovery, which began with the maritime explorations of the 15th century that sparked the era of the European colonial empires. By 1921, the British Empire held sway over a population of about 458 million people, approximately one quarter of the world's population. It covered about 14.2 million square miles, about a quarter of the Earth's total land area. Though uh, it has now mostly evolved into the Commonwealth of Nations, British influence remains strong throughout the world in economic practice, legal and governmental systems, militarily, society sports such as cricket and football, and the English language itself, to name just a few. The English language, right? We have the, uh, the Celts, we have the, the Anglos and the Saxons, all these different tribes that we talked about in Stone Kingdom, but we have Angle, right? Anglo, Anglo-Saxon. We have Angle, which forms Ingle, which forms English. Uh, and so that is the language, the universal language that God has bestowed um, upon his chosen people to spread the gospel to the four corners of the world. Pretty straightforward. Not preaching a racial gospel, but if we want to correctly identify Israel, don't identify enemies of Jesus Christ. Identify God's people and identify true history. That's important. Because of its size at the peak of its power, it was often said that, quote, the sun never sets on the British Empire because the empire span across the uh, world ensued that the sun was always shining on at least one of its numerous colonies. Well, brother, you have anything to add? I've been talking the whole time. Oh, no, you been you, great, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's All right. Fascinating. All right, so let me just put, I know this will be controversial a little bit, but Brit-ish, British means, uh, Brit means covenant, ish is people, and then you have Israelism, Isra Israelism, which would be the study of Israel, studying who Israel is. We study, we learned about the 12 tribes, and we learned that coming into the covenant land, and so Brit plus ish, right? Brit plus ish is going to be meaning covenant plus people. Yep. And then we have Israel plus ism equals a descendant of the Hebrew patriarch Jacob, uh, God's chosen people plus a distinctive doctrine. British Israelism therefore is a doctrine that the covenant people of the Bible are the Caucasian race. Or at least a part, ladies and gentlemen, Israel is God's covenant people bearing the name of the Hebrew word Berith or Brith or Brithen or Britain or Britain means covenant lamb. These three words are historically, 
are historically, right, uh, referring to the God of the people of the Old Testament, right? And applicable uh, to a specific people. Out of Brith came Brit. Uh, Brit-ish means covenant man. Therefore, out of covenant land, Great Britain and covenant man came this most precious and priceless doctrine, right? So now we have the identification of true Israel of the Bible. So I thought that was really interesting, learning all about um, God's covenant people and the covenant land. And you notice out of the covenant land, the seventh purification of God's word is the authorized version or the King James Bible. And without this covenant land, Without the without this um, this liberty, right? We would not have we would not have the freedom that we have the, uh, that Americans have. We wouldn't have the form of government that we have in America, right? So that's what we're talking about now. We're going to pick up in the next chapter. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ is the greatest is the greater David. We're going to talk about king and kingdom on earth. Um, we're going to get into we're going to get into the coronation stone of Jacob's pillar, pillar stone. That's also some interesting information. We know out of Abram, Abram was name was changed to Abraham, and he became a father of many nations. And kings, king lines would come from the loins of Abraham. That's what we see is um, coming from. Uh, the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and that's that's very important. So, I I we just learned about the first Christian nation was in Great Britain. That's a big deal. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So the history of Western civilization shows that the progress of liberty and the principles of the free world were developed centuries before the Protestant Reformation. So. Come to the living word of God. Come to Jesus Christ. God bless you. Bye.